Well, hello everyone. This is such a joy uh, for us. Uh, it's such an important evening and we're so excited to be welcoming all of you here and welcoming, uh, I mean, we don't need to welcome Kenneth Franto. This is his house more than probably anyone else. Uh, there are books, this book, uh, there are books that are easy to read, but very long and deeper to do. Not because writing and making them are especially complicated tasks, but because they reflect on a long intellectual trajectory, both individual and collective. That is the case of this book that I'd say started to be cooked even before 1950, when a younger Kenneth Frampton initiated his journey as a student of the Architectural Association with a scholarship from the British Natural Asphalt Council. <laughs> Kenneth Frampton Conversations with Daniel Talesnik, who is here with us, uh, is based on seven in-person conversations between Columbia GISA professor emeritus Kenneth Frampton and the GISA PhD and AED graduate architectural historian and University of Cambridge teaching associate Daniel Talesnik. Over a period between October 2011 and October 2013. The book has been published by Columbia Books of Architecture and the City, uh, and, I, it, and it very meaningfully opens with the Columbia GISA professor, uh, Mary McLeod's, who's here, essay, Kenneth Franto's idea of the critical. The critical is actually, I'm so excited to have read your piece, Mary, because the critical is a word that comes with us all the time, right? And Mary told an amazing account of how that uh, was brought in by Kenneth and in looking at the work of a number of people that he was uh, 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 reflecting on. It has been designed by Scott van der See, that probably is around here as well. And, uh, but what is most important for us, and a, a kind of a, a, a something that makes probably everyone here so happy, is that Kenneth Franton is with us tonight. Uh, and basically he's happy here to have this conversation, a conversation of conversations. He will be speaking first, followed by Mary McLeod and by Daniel Talesnik. And they will all engage in a conversation with Mario Wooden, who is here, and of course, professor of practice uh, at Columbia, GSAP, and the director of the MR program, apart from a well-known practitioner uh, with his firm. And Isabel Kirham Lewitt, who is here, who is GSAP director of publications, and director of uh, CBAC, Columbia Books of Architecture and the City. Um, and the, this debate will be moderated with the GSAP Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs, uh, Bart Jan Polman. But I want to show my copy of the book. <laughs> and the copy of the book is very, very, very worked out, but I'm not ashamed to show how much I underlined in it, because actually it makes me think of Kenneth Franton, actually, what he did with Marcus, right? <laughs> And, and there's something about books that can be read like that, that can be underlined, that are so important for, that, for us. Uh, as Mary McLeod puts it, Kenneth Frampton is arguably the most influential architectural historian since Siegfried Giddon. He's a historian, a theorist, a teacher, and a critic who has not only spoken to fellow historians, but has spoken and impacted to designers and practitioners, which is incredibly unique, right? As Frampton himself states, he settled for a writer on architecture. By claiming how material, cultural, and climatic difference is situated across the world, he soon reached a global impact. Kenneth Frampton's work is inseparable from Columbia GSAP's history. He joined Columbia in 1972, the, years that James Polsek became, the year that James Polsek became GSAP's dean. After a period teaching at the Royal College of Art in London from 1974 to 1976, 77, still being a full-time faculty at GSAP during that period, as Mary uh, reminded me, he returned here to Columbia, where he was named Professor Emeritus in 2021. So this means that, uh, Kenneth Franto, you've been teaching here for 50 years, right? And I would like everyone to recognize this and help, uh, join me. After. As Daniel Talesny puts it, this book opens a window onto Frampton's relational way of thinking about architecture. 
one in which buildings and architects are always understood in reference to other cultural, and I would say, I would add to that, political patterns. It provides a non-linear account of Kenneth Frampton's professional, academic, and intellectual progress, but also the progress of his ideas and how they got nuance and depth to time and historical events. Very specifically, the development, influence, and evolutions of his 1980 book, Modern Architecture, A Critical History, published the year, the year of Portuguese's, uh, uh, Portuguese's Venice Biennale, a time when Robert Stern's postmodern ideas impacted Colombia and, and therefore the world. His 1983 essay towards a critical regionalism, six points for an architecture of resistance, and the 1995 essay, Studies in Tectonic Culture, the Poetics of Construction in 19th and, 19th, uh, and 20th uh, Century Architecture. In these books, in these essays, in his work, modern, critical, regional, environmental, tectonic culture, politics, as a constant commitment to the socialist aspect of modern movement, at, as Kenneth Frampton would explain, and resistance, as inseparably from social, socially, politically, and labor-informed notion of notions of sustainability, all of them have been terms that have shaped architectural discourse and practice across the world. As a whole, this book speaks about the present and how to be an architect in facing, in facing its defiance. As registered by his book in October 13, uh, Franton said, in 20, 2011, Franton said, it is possible to see the present, the present crisis of capitalism as indicative of fundamental contradictions. And he carries on. Although, although it is reasonable to have a rather despairing outlook on the future prospects of our species, it seems to me that this issue of sustainability represents a point of departure from which we may build a fragmentary alternative to the present impasse. In the critical regionalist thesis, I tried to argue that this act of resistance was not only cultural, but also political. The idea that a small unit would be able to resist the globalized system to some extent. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kenneth Frampton. a bit too much, I think. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, I feel that uh, the, the warmth in this space is such that I could get away with anything. A bit like Donald Trump, I mean, t terrible. <laughs> uh, we'll stay out of that area. But um, I've written down uh, stuff, of course, which I uh, will try to... Uh, N yeah, not make too boring, um, and um, I don't know, on occasions like these I'm reminded of John Ruskin's image of, of um, yes, image of uh, God, basically, uh, and uh, <coughs> which he likens to his uh, critic coach in rugby school, who said at some point to him, because he was hopeless, athletically speaking. That'll be quite enough from you, Mr. Ruskin. And I feel uh, this book also is too much in the sense that it's already quite enough from me. But anyway, we won't go there because it's <laughs> yeah, well, it, not possible to deal with it. It's too late in any case. <clears throat> and, um, but you know, the, today began in a, and I haven't written this down, began in a kind of uh, unusual way because, uh, uh, because of a very close friend of mine uh, from Serbia. Uh, two Serbians showed up for breakfast in my hotel, uh, one an architect and one a philosopher. And uh, the, um, the point being that they want, they're, they've already published uh, two books on the issue of philosophy and architecture, and they want to engage me somehow or other in the future. And one of the uh, things they said, but you know, we want the challenge is to, <coughs> to, uh, 
and I'm, I've not written down any of this, so uh, now I'm completely lost. Uh, the challenge is that, uh, you know, we want you to choose one word which would uh, uh, somehow uh, define, you know, what you think about, uh, what you think about the field, what you think about the situation of the moment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I, I couldn't come up with this word, you know. I said, you know, without repeating myself. I did mention the word aporia, and they liked that because apparently, uh, um, what is his name? Now I've forgotten his name, but the very famous French philo philosopher wrote, uh, Derrida, wrote a book with the title aporia. And uh, so they, but you know, okay. But then, uh, so they went, caught their plane back to Belgrade. They'd been here for a while, and uh, I sort of wandered around. And at some point, it came to me that the, the key word I would use is microcosm. Because I think if one really faces the fact, you know, that what architects have a chance of doing in their lives is to make a significant microcosm, you know, or more than one. But anyway, it's a microcosm. And I think we shouldn't forget that, you know, that within the total spectrum of uh, production and consumption, you know, the most one can perhaps achieve is a microcosm in which, uh, you know, for their lifespan, a human being or human beings, individual or collective, can, uh, as it were, find a kind of spiritual shelter, or both, both physical and spiritual shelter. I think it's the point, really. It has to be both physical and spiritual. And uh, it reminds me of Barragan's remark, which I find unbelievable. When he got the Pritzker Prize, he said, an architecture which doesn't achieve tranquility fails in its spiritual mission. It's an unbelievable aphorism, I think. And, uh, and then I thought, or I've never written it, but I thought, you know, the, the problem is how to, how to combine tranquility and calm. Uh, no, sorry, tranquility and calm are the same. Tranquility and vitality, that's the challenge, I think. And, uh, but this question, I mean, it's so profound, I think, this question of uh, an architecture which doesn't achieve tranquility fails in its spiritual mission. And uh, so this together, maybe microcosm, uh, tranquility. I mean, I, you know, I, I wrote a lot of stuff here, and I'm not going to read it. That's good for everybody. And, <laughs> and uh, because life is too short. And, uh <laughs> and uh, I mean, uh, I'm basically, I've said all I have to say, really. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I deeply, I, I, I feel very, very convinced about that, you know, this, this question of microcosm. Ah, it reminds me of one last thing. The master of aphorisms, by the way, is uh, without question Alvaro Ziza, you know, unbelievable aphorism. I mean, he, he had, the one unbelievable aphorism is the idea is in the place, not in your head. Oh, it's unbelievable aphorism, I think. His, his aphorisms uh, are, you know, archi young architects, old architects, whatever. We could all, these aphorisms are unbelievable. And um, I was thinking of another aphorism, which now I've forgotten, fortunately. <laughs> so uh, I won't go on about that. But, ah, uh, oh, yes. Ah, oh, that's the beautiful thing he says. These are the microcosms. Somewhere you know, early in the 70s, he says, uh, most of my works were never published and uh, never built. It's a um, not the exact words. Um, uh, many of them were destroyed or altered. And then he says this, because it's, it's in a passage it's in a text which is called The Flittering Image of Reality, actually. And uh, because he, he, he develops this idea as, as the, fli the flittering image of reality which you have to kind of uh, reach for, basically. 
he doesn't say that, but but anyway, he says most of mo most of my houses were, were this is in the mid seventies were uh, demolished or they they've been altered or uh, whatever, and he says most beautiful thing I think, but something remains fathered by someone, you know, it's the most beautiful thing. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Hard act to follow, of course. Um, no one can quite come even close to Ken's charm. Um, hi, it's, it's great. I am going to be a little boring. I swore when I was beginning teaching that I would never read a lecture, and I don't think I ever did when I was teaching at Columbia, but I had to write something tonight, maybe because I'm a little nervous. Um, but first, it's wonderful to be here again and see so many familiar faces and so many former students, colleagues, and friends of Ken. Um, and I was counting on Daniel to say all the thanks first, but they just switched us. He will give a more complete thanks. Uh, but I have to say thanks to um, Dean Andres Jock, Bart Young Pullman for making this event finally happen and to Isabel Kirkham Lewitt and Joanna Klopenberg and the whole team uh, that's behind them for their care, diplomacy, and patience. I want to stress that word, patience. Um, making this modest but very special book happen. Um, there are deans of the past to thank, um, and I also want to thank um, the graphic designer, Scott Van Dezin, I'm mispronouncing it, I'm sure, who we really put through the ringer and thank you, Scott, for doing a great job. Um, Daniel and I hope the book serves both as an introduction to Ken, especially for those of you who did not have him as a teacher, but also, and I have a feeling this is most of you in the room, who do know him, an opportunity to learn more about him and the evolution of his thinking and rethinking about architecture for all these many years. Before turning to the book, however, I want to talk briefly a little bit about his career. You heard the very beginning from Andres. Um, his 50-some plus or minus years of teaching at Columbia, and especially focusing on his role in developing the history theory program. I thought he was going to talk about studio, but he changed his mind. Uh, so unfortunately, you're going to get only a slice. And this talk is a bit of a hybrid, a mixture of tribute, and I really want to give a warm tribute to Ken, a bit of school history, um, and maybe an introduction to one slice of the book. Most of all, as I mentioned, I want to take this occasion to thank him for his immense knowledge and remarkable writing, and I would like to suggest that he probably has seen more and knows more and thought more deeply about 20th century buildings including a few 21st century buildings, than anyone else, for his constant engagement with both contemporary practice and education, helping to transform Columbia into one of the leading architecture schools in the world. And most of all, and this is personal, for being such a warm, supportive, and gracious colleague for so many years. I keep thinking how very fortunate I was when I began teaching at Columbia in 1978. I don't quite make 50 years, but I'm getting there. Uh, to have him as a mentor and colleague, and then slowly over time as a dear friend. I also want to say that despite my youth when I arrived, I was only 28, he always treated me as an equal undoubtedly long before I even came close, and I certainly am not there yet. Um, and I, I just, it was an amazing um, fact. In fact, in retrospect, I'm almost in awe of how much he and also Jim Polshek and then Chair Richard Pluns, uh, how much faith they had or trust in me as a very green young professor. Of course, Ken had a rich life and career as both a practicing architect and writer before he arrived at Columbia in 1972, which the book interviews 
with Daniel give, I think, an excellent entree. First, working as a practicing architect, and here as a stand-in for his years of practice is a picture of the Coringham Housing Estate in London, and I can't resist showing you his nice, crisp drawings, um, and which he designed while working with Douglas Stephen from 1961 to 65. And second, as a writer and editor, um, and here is, you saw the cover a second ago, and a spread uh, from his first book, done again with Stephen, British Buildings, 1960 to 64, um, with some amazing photos by somebody I'm going to mispronounce, Michael Carpentier. Carpentier? I'm not sure. And several of the many issues of AD uh, that he was responsible for as technical editor from 1962 to 65, where in fact some of the ideas of what he will later call critical regionalism began to be formulated, especially in this issue uh, that discusses Gino Valli. But I also want to note his recognition of an emerging avant-garde, or we could even say neo-avant-garde, uh, when they were little known in the English world at the time. His tenure at AD overlapped with his time at Stephen's office. How he could do it all, I can't even fathom. But as all of us know, he used to walk by the office in 400 Avery. Uh, Ken was always working, very hard. And just imp as important, he always seemed to enjoy it. I, I couldn't, there was just such pleasure in work for him. After leaving Britain in 1966, he began teaching at Princeton. I just missed him as an architecture student, but he was legendary there. I remember being assigned his brilliant essay on the League of Nations competition comparing Le Corbusier's and Hannes Meyer's entries to the League of Nations competition. And if you haven't read it, for those who are younger in the audience, I really encourage you to because it stands up beautifully in time. During this period, beginning in 68, he was also part of the Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies, founded by his former Princeton colleague, Peter Eisman. And Ken, of course, would go on to be one of the founding editors of Oppositions. But back to Columbia. Ken joined, we've, as we've already heard, the faculty in 72, giving up a tenured position in Princeton. As he already explained, I thought he explained, but maybe not quite. He and Jim Polshek, the new dean, almost immediately began rebuilding the school, which in all honesty was in shambles, perhaps honorable ones, after the events of 68. The initial focus was on the studio curriculum, um, and the school, very much with Ken's guidance, began hiring a remarkable design faculty. Um, and he, I was expecting him to tell you all about combining the kind of formal rigor of Cornell with the social and um, sort of Team 10 perspective of RPI, uh, but he didn't. So I leave it at that. Read Daniel's interviews. There might be something there. Um, but in any case, one of the important initiatives that remains is the housing studio. And at that point, it was taught by type. And I just show you um, a spread from the school publication at the time, a praise of some of Ken's students' work. Uh, he was obsessed with the perimeter block, um, I, th I always think related to the Corbus Immobile Villa, um, but you get some idea. That has changed, but what has remained is this idea of collaboration that was part of the original program and, of course, housing. Um, but I'm going to focus on another aspect of the school in which he was fundamental, that is the restructuring of the history theory curriculum in the early 80s. When I came to Columbia, quite frankly, the architectural history theory's offerings were a bit of a hodgepodge quite random. There were, of course, some excellent classes, including Ken's lectures on modern architecture and his legendary seminars on building analysis. I might also mention Richard Plunz's lectures 
on New York City housing and the history of urban planning, as well as a wonderful array of architectural history courses offered in art history, which in fact covered a wide chronological and geographical span. But there was no structured history theory curriculum for the MARC program. I remember the first couple of years at Columbia, I'd sometimes felt like I had to teach a new lecture course every semester to fill what was perceived as some hole. At that time, that is the late 70s, all of us who taught history also taught studio. For example, Aldo Gergola taught Italian Renaissance, maybe for better or worse. And no one, including myself, had a PhD. That would come struggling while I was teaching at Columbia. But Ken realized that just as the studio sequence had required major overhaul and a pedagogical vision, so too the history theory curriculum needed to be tackled. Working closely with the faculty, and I would like to stress how collaborative Ken always was, and with the support of Polshek and Richard Pons and Max Bond, who were successively chairs of the architecture division then, as was Ken following Bond when he left for City in 85. Ken implemented two major structural changes to the history theory curriculum. This is a bit embarrassing. Okay. The first was a two-semester sequence required lecture course for incoming MARC students. What was originally called thresholds in architectural history, later just architectural history one, two, and the second was distribution requirements. The survey course, which was admittedly Western in content, was based on the idea that we would focus on moments of critical change in architecture whether theoretical, programmatic, technological, or social, hence the word threshold. Initially, we thought we would begin with the Renaissance, but after a couple of years of trying that, it became clear it was unwieldy, too long a historical span. And we changed the time frame, inspired in part by Michel Foucault's periodization in The Order of Things, and began with the late 17th century. He always says his period began earlier, but the examples are always late 17th century onward. And namely, that was Wren and Perrault's challenge to notions of natural or positive beauty. Initially, too, Ken and I had planned to alternate semesters, and we did do that for two or three years, but somehow it ended out that I usually taught the first semester, and he taught the second, except when one of us was on leave. And an important objective was always to examine the connections between architecture and larger social, political, and economic forces. And although the introductory sequence has changed significantly over the years, both in format, time frame, and geographic range, I think the legacy of social and political concern is still very much there. And I, forgive me, I don't have Ken's archives, so you're going to see my version of these documents that I dug up in the files, including the next one. Well, this isn't me, but memos from some of the history faculty. The second major change was the implement implementation of distribution requirements. The decision which came after multiple committee meetings and much intense debate was to have five, with students required to take court classes in four of the five subject areas, which were then pre-1750, non-Western, urban, modern, and American. As I recall, these discussions happened, and you only had to take, as I said, four of them. Um, these discussions happened while Ken was chair, if my memory's not playing tricks, which beginning around 85. And I want to note that we were with UC Berkeley, one of the very few architecture schools that then stressed the need for courses beyond Europe and North America. I remember in the 80s, Gerilyn Dodds and then Zainab Chelik, the older Zainab Chelik, teaching Islamic architecture. Patricia Morton and later Kumya Kudos teaching Japanese. Jean-Louis Bourgeois offered a seminar on African architecture. 
and I could go on. There were also, uh, there was also, and this may have been due to the legacy of Fitch, um, but maybe independent of that, an interest in vernacular architecture, which Gwendolyn Wright, who had studied with J.B. Jackson, taught for a couple of years. And as a stand-in for her course, since I don't have her syllabi, I show you a spread from an early issue of Pricey where she's writing on vernacular. This is, of course, now a requirement of NAB, but I like to think Columbia was way ahead of, the, um, of them. Anyway, and as the names just mentioned suggest, an amazing group of full-time and adjunct faculty got hired in the 80s including for that period a considerable number of women, notably Gwendolyn Wright, who I believe was the first woman tenured at GSAP. There were some earlier efforts, Francis, but didn't work. And Zainab Chalik, again, the elder Zainab Chalik, uh, was among the historians. But there was also, and there were so many women teaching studio then too, Susanna Torrey, Loretta Vincerelli, Barbara Lichtenberg, Ghislaine Herman News, uh, and and more. But there was also an amazing array of visiting history theory faculty. Alan Cahoon, Robin Evans, Jean-Louis Cohen, Helen Searing, Joan Ackman, who later became head of the Buell Center, um, and again, others. In the early 90s came the next big change. Bernard Schumi, who became dean in 1988, decided that it was time GSAP had a doctoral program. I, I don't know if this is true, Bernard can correct me, but we thought his decision, or I thought it was, was probably in part a strategic move to keep Ken at Columbia. Um, he was always being wooed by other schools. Ken and I worked closely, and I, I want to stress with the full support of Bernard, you'll see his name in these letters giving us directions. Um, uh, uh, we had to write up a program, and it was like a three-year process. I can't tell you the bureaucracy. Uh, we had to go through the university level and then finally get state approval. Uh, it was decided that it would focus on architecture after 1850, in part to distinguish it from art history's program although there have always been blurred lines, and that it too would emphasize political, social, and cultural factors critical to architectural developments. And again, like the history curriculum in the MARC program, we always saw the doctoral program scope as global, encouraging students to work on subjects related to their own background or to whatever languages uh, they knew. For example, Ken Oshima was on, wrote on Japan, Ezra Atkin on Turkey, Eva Luisa Pelkonen on Finland, Tao Zhu on China, Ioana Theokropoulou on Greece, and there are others actually in the room, uh, Marta Caldera on Portugal, um, and I could go again, keep going. We were fortunate to attract, in large part due to Ken's own global reach, and worldwide reputation, and of course, there are probably more translations since then, but there are a few. Um, uh, some, um, and this reputation became really clear to me when I was at an event with him in Hong Kong in 2016. And if you look at the list of the names um, on your uh, right, uh, you'll see that people from Asia, uh, as well as elsewhere, uh, were clearly um, big supporters and admirers of Ken. Not to mention, which was an important factor in drawing students, his considerable charm. We got an amazing group of students who've gone on to have outstanding careers. Although the financial aid in those year, early years was meager, I still remember Ezra Atkin and David Rifkin having to teach at three schools while they were writing their theses. There was, besides a deep commitment to intellectual rigor and archival research, an amazing warmth and camaraderie among the students, inspired in part by Ken's own generosity, wit, and openness. I might mention, too, the wonderful gatherings he would have at his loft, and here it's essential to mention Sylvia, who would always graciously host these events with incredible style 
and taste and make sure there were delicious morsels to eat, not to mention lots of wine, which Ken kept pouring. <laughs> anyway, we all had a lot of fun at those events. Thirteen years ago, the doctoral students had a party for Ken's 80th. They baked cakes in the form of architectural buildings, his favorite ones, and not just the rectilinear ones. <laughs> I think you can see in this next image that Andrea Merritt kindly provided. We have a version of Ronchamp there. <laughs> but I remember uh, very vividly one of the toasts, a student in a toast, a student described the program as, quote, magical. I was startled at first. It's not a word you hear often in academia. But in many ways, the student captured the atmosphere of those early years of the program. And I like to see the program today, now larger and better known, as part of this incredible legacy to architecture and architecture education. Now, briefly, and this might not be as much fun as thinking about cake, um, I'd like to discuss um, quickly, um, I hope, uh, the, my contribution to the book. As I told you, this was a bit of a hodgepodge. Um, as Andre said, it's titled Kenneth Frampton's Idea of the Critical. In this essay, I wanted to explore a side of Kenneth's thinking that I thought was often overlooked, both by architects and theorists, who have tended to stress his fascination with Hannah Arendt and his interest in phenomenology, both very important components of his thought and continue to be so. I was struck, however, how frequently the word critical appeared in his books and essay titles and even in his teaching. The building analysis seminar that I mentioned even had the word critical built form in its title. And the book, of course, that came out of that seminar, again, check the subtitle. It seems so obvious, but what did this word mean? I was also struck how indebted we, that is, writers about architecture, are to Ken for the use of this word in architectural discourse. And I might say, for better or worse, and Ken might say worse, I don't know, given how ubiquitous its usage has become. Um, and needless to say, it generated, too, a kind of counter-movement in the early 21st century, the post-critical. And by the way, Ken would not allow me to use all these images. I wanted to have a big spread of all the critical titles, um, and he vetoed that. So um, I guess he didn't want to be associated with all of them. But the question I had was, what did this word critical mean to him? Where did it come from? And who were the writers who inspired him or might have prompted him in its usage? The word critical, of course, has a long history, deriving from the Greek word kritikos, meaning judgment or discernment. But its modern usage is usually seen as coming from two sources. Kant's three critiques, and I won't even try to summarize that meaning, and Marx's critique of political economy and capital, in which critique for Marx is a kind of ideological dismantling. In general, and forgive my kind of cryptic summary, this is meant that the word is associated with a kind of self-reflexivity that goes beyond intention and popular reception, and in the case of Marxist theorists, a belief that critical examination can contribute to social and political transformation. But Ken's source, as it was for so many of his generation, and for mine too, was the Frankfurt School, the group of scholars who had worked at the Institute for Social Research in the 1930s in Germany and sought to extend Marxism's ideological critique to the cultural sphere. 
This is not the occasion to describe in detail his discovery of these thinkers, but I thought I might give you a few indications through a quick series of slides, but not all of them are in the book, by the way. Um, I, I took up too much space as it was, but which suggests their importance to him. First, and perhaps obviously, was Walter Benjamin, whose essay, Theses on the Philosophy of History, he first quoted in Oppositions 1, 1973, in a piece titled Industrialization and the Crisis of Modern Architecture. And again, it appears in the introduction of the first four editions of Modern Architecture, A Critical History. I might also note that Benjamin's synopsis, and I, I don't know if this was causal or not, um, uh, synopsis Paris Capital of the 19th Century was published in the same 1969 issue of Perspecta as Ken's wonderful essay on the Maison de Verre. And of course, the links between Benjamin and Ar Hannah Arendt, whom he'd already begun reading in Britain, were very strong, since Arendt had um, edited the first edition of Benjamin's essays in English, the book cover I just showed you, Illuminations, which was published in that all-important year, 68. But also, very important to his writings, Ken's writings of the 70s and early 80s, and perhaps less recognized today, was Herbert Marcuse's book, Eros and Civilization, which Alan Cahoon had given him uh, in the late 60s, and Ken thinks may have actually been first given to Alan, or at least recommended by Thomas Maldonado. Ken read it with incredible thoroughness, and apparently lots of passion. And I can't resist showing you a few pages. <laughs> um, you saw one image from Andres, but I'll show you a few more. I can't help it. <laughs> And that one, there. And if you've, just a, a little anecdote, if you'll forgive me, if you've ever been edited by Ken, it, it looks a little like that. <laughs> but instead of saying très important or very important, it usually says move or delete. <laughs> I know. Anyway, um, back to Ken. Um, as writings of the members of the Frankfurt School were translated, and uh, this was really a product of New German Critique, New Left Review, they all started being translated in the 70s and 80s. Ken's own reading of these members expanded to include books by Adorno and Habermas. Um, and I show you um, their quite minima moralia, which was given to him by a former Columbia student and teacher, Alessandro Latour, shows up quite frequently in his writing, and you'll see a reference later. Um, but his ideas about critique owe debts to contemporary Marxists as well, most notably the Argentine designer, Thomas Maldonado. And by the way, the English translation of design, nature, and revolution towards a critical ecology was one of the rare instances, in fact, the only one I could find in English where the word critical appears in an architectural context before Ken. And Claude Schneidt, whom he first encountered on a trip to Ulm in 1963 with Monica Pigeon, the editor of AD, an experience that prompted his own later oppositions essay on the school and again, Hannes Meyer and his importance. Ken includes within modern architecture a remarkable passage from Schneidt's 1967 essay, Architecture and Political Commitment, about how the dictates of profit and capitalism had led to the degradation of modernist dreams for better housing and mankind's liberation. At the end of my essay in the book, I discuss some of the similarities and differences between Tafori and Ken's critique of capitalism and architecture. 
What I didn't know when I began working on the piece is that Tafori wrote an early review of modern architecture at Ken's own request for a publication that I showed earlier that he referred to, Modern Architecture and the Critical Present. It's a largely positive review, and in it, Tafori admits to the possibility of a reconciliation between phenomenology and Marxism as being possible. However, there are significant differences not overtly stated in this quite polite review of Tafori's. And he, of course, had to refer to an essay that hadn't been translated yet in English, a little bit of intellectual show off, maybe. Anyway, unlike Tafori, Ken grants architecture the possibility of still having a critical valence and offering as offering a way to avoid closure. He continues to see the generative and positive qualities of form and experience to create what he calls a space for architectural practice that resists the most blatant forces of commodification, even if it's at what he called a microcosmic level. Nor is he afraid to give examples. And there are some beautiful ones in the book. Um, I just show you a few. Nor is he troubled by a phrase that Tafori uses uh, with some criticism, the phrase operative critic. But rather than summarize Ken's position, I'd like to close by citing two quotations from Ken, which might uh, invite further reflection and maybe even discussion. The first is from a 2001 interview with Gavork Hartunian, where Ken specifically addresses Tafori. I'm skipping the first sentence. I am aware that the Marxist hardline, then as now, thinks of my writing as operative criticism, as permitting the survival of anachronistic hopes of design as a liberative agent, which Tafori dismisses as regressive. However, he also concedes that under present circumstances, one is, quote, left to navigate an empty space in which anything can happen, but nothing is decisive, unquote which sums up, I suppose, basically what I think about my position. The second passage is from the last essay of his 2002 book, Labor, Work, and Architecture, and here's back to Adorno, but now titled Minimal Moralia, Reflections on Recent Swiss-German Production. Here Ken states in a quite moving passage, at least for me, what navigating and writing in this empty space means for him. One can only hope that others will be able to sustain their early capacity or alternatively to reveal an untapped potential for the pursuit of the art of architecture in all its anachron anachronistic fullness. One perhaps needs to add that one does not indulge in critique for the sake of a gratuitous negativity, but rather to spur the critical sensibility, to sharpen the debate, to overcome, as far as this is feasible, the debilitating dictates of fashion, and above all, to guard against the ever-present threat in a mediatic age of sliding into intellectual sonambulance, where everything seems to appear to be for the aestheticized best in the best of all commodified worlds. Thank you. And here he is again. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of weeks ago, I met Kenneth Frampton at the bar of the Architectural Association. After we finished talking, and as we were leaving, I noticed that the people sitting in the table around us all had copies of his books. And evidently, they had been waiting 
and eavesdropping in our conversation in order to approach him and start an impromptu book signing. At around the same time, there was an article in the Financial Times on Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and how, I quote, they represent two paradigms of choice so many of us face in this technologically accelerated, morally, morally restless times to keep up or not. Jagger is active on Instagram, obsessed with keeping up to date with trends to the point of having pushed the stones at some point into disco and included some hip hop in one of his solo projects. And he refuses to write an autobiography. Richards instead does not appear to care about social media or trends, prefers reading in his library, wrote an autobiography, and appears to enjoy interviews about his career. Having witnessed Ken's fame that day, I left the EA relieved, thinking he might be more of a Keith than a Mick. It's a privilege to be gathered here celebrating architecture-related ideas that led to books, articles, seminars, conferences, discussions, polemics, and we could add architecture, buildings, I mean. Ideas that involve conviction, but that also changed over time. Ken's critical and reflexive outlooks involve a concatenation of ongoing paths, and later in the evening, we will get to talk to him about theories, buildings built and unbuilt, lost utopias, dissatisfactions, old and new, and several decades of architectural agendas. Ken is and has been concerned with the future of our profession and the relevance of the discipline, where it can ground itself and how it can continue to move forward. I think that having this conversation today is particularly significant, a point in time when our world is bleeding in so many places and it is in times of crisis that architectural culture struggles the most to remain relevant. One excuse for this event is a book of interviews, a set of conversations between Ken and myself, a book that will reveal at least that we both enjoy talking to each other. A book that has had an acute and loving introductory essay by Mary MacLeod, in which she reconstructs intellectual affinities and is able to assign values and significance to Ken's work, and that paves the way for a set of interviews that inquire into ways of being dedicated slash addicted to thinking and rethinking about architecture. Ken has been devoted to caring about architecture, a grand amour, and uh, this relationship has had some of its most energetic moments when he thought the discipline had lost its compass. The story of these interviews can be found in a brief preface in the book, where I explain that the start of this project can initially be connected to an assignment for a seminar here at Columbia, a class to which I arrived following some funds awarded to me by the Buell Center. So I thank the Buell Center as a first thank you of the night. Um, as part of this seminar, I had to interview someone extensively. And instead, I had the idea of interviewing a couple of people to reconstruct the idea and process of a relevant architectural book. Once I settled for modern architecture, a critical history, my plan was to first interview Robin Middleton, who, as acquisitions editor for Thames and Hudson, commissioned the book in 1970, and then continue with Ken, who published the first edition in 1980. While Robin told me the whole story, he was not convinced about a formal interview. Luckily, Ken was, and the project took a more monographic and biographical direction. And today, we can find the outcome in this publication. The first two interviews became the seminar project. But as I was left with too many questions, I suggested we program more interviews. From the third interview onwards, the approach was to follow the arc of Ken's professional and personal biography, which led to deeper ruminations on built and written forms of architectural production. The interview span Ken's early days as an architecture student at the Guilford School of Art to his decades-long tenure as a professor here at Columbia University. Together, they capture the circumstances, and I would say personal, political, social, cultural, in which he started writing, thinking, and publishing his ideas on architecture, providing a framework not only for his time 
as the technical editor, as Mary mentioned, of architectural design, but also for some of his most resounding publications. In sketching out the intellectual atmosphere of architectural culture on both sides of the Atlantic from the 60s onward, the conversations also reveal how this theoretical terrain informed his most critical contributions to architectural thought and practice. These seven interviews took place over a two-year period, and I would argue that they are both a history and a personal reflection on the work of one of architecture's most enduring writers. They open a window onto our relational way of thinking about architecture, one in which buildings and architects are always understood in reference to other cultural patterns. They unfold a thought process where Ken is constantly editing, refining, and reacting to his own work, a practice that is continued over the course of all of these conversations. This collection of interviews meanders, producing not a straightforward account, but an entangled discursive map of his life and ideas. Together, they reveal a portrait that is as much about Ken himself as about the cultural environment from which these ideas emerged. That was the long explanation. I think the short one is a simple fact that becomes evident throughout the interviews. Ken likes buildings and he likes talking about them. Um, Groucho Marx was the one never to forget a face, but in given cases, make an exception. Ken, in turn, I would guess, would like to forget many, many buildings. But instead of ignoring them, he has tried to move the discipline forward by addressing their issues. Over the years, running into Ken, walking up and down the stairs of this building, Um, over the years, running into Ken walking up and down the stairs of this building was an opportunity to talk buildings. So for those of you who are currently using this building, there is something to be said about taking the stairs. <laughs> Ken talking about buildings usually involves a different angle. And he was, and is, I would argue, dissatisfied with so much of the current production of architecture. That is, of course, until something catches his eye, and then he is eager to share his opinion. Ken has connections, and he knows people that know people, and wherever he lands in the world, he is driven to see buildings, sometimes by architects looking for his blessing, but most of the time by fellow junkies that can also act as dealers, namely friends or former students that just want to see and comment buildings with him. Like many good building analysts, Ken had, Ken had the chance of designing buildings himself. He can draw, and this he can do very well, as Mary showed you, which adds, in my books, to his acute eye. However, to say that I only enjoy talking to Ken because of his love of buildings would be reductive. There is something more intangible, something that can be described as sharing and caring for a culture that is specific to architecture, which most of the times, it's not only rock and roll, but we like it. Uh, I want to start by thanking the Buell Center again for awarding me the funds that ignited the interviews. I want to thank Dean Andres Jaque for making this happen, as he inherited our little book problem and has been extremely elegant and supportive about it. Interim Dean Wei Ping Wu was supportive of this project, and former Dean Amal Andraos was the one that gave us the green light in the first place. So heartfelt thanks to the three of you. More thanks to Barjan Polman, his team, and to Mario Gooden for hosting the event. On the production front, thanks to Isabel Kirkham Lewis for her attentive leadership in this process. And special thanks to Johanna Joseph, Johanna Kloppenburg, and James Graham, all from Columbia Books on Architecture in the City, Present and Past. Also, and this is a thank you in capital letters, to graphic designer Scott van der See. Where are you, Scott? for enduring and succeeding. <laughs> Finally, um, thank you, Mary, for sharing with us your wonderful essay that complements and completes the book. And last but not least, thank you, Ken, for the interviews and for our ongoing conversations in London. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so to Kenneth, of course, uh, to, to Mary and to Danielle for these wonderful um, presentations and remarks. 
And I should also say for this uh, remarkable book, I think I also trying to compete about uh, with the post number of post-its um, <laughs> here. <laughs> um, I want to welcome to the stage Isabel uh, Kirkham Lewitt, uh, who's the director of Columbia uh, Books, and Mario Gooden, professor of practice and the director of Mario Gooden Studio. Uh, my name is Bartian Polman. I'm uh, director of exhibitions and public programming here at GSEPS. Um, and perhaps to start the conversation, uh, Ken, I wanted to begin with something that Danielle actually sort of um, pointed out to me and we, we were wondering about um, is that maybe you could talk a bit about uh, where the idea of critical regionalism ended at or if it ended at all. Um, you speak about moving towards a sort of tectonic culture because of the, the limitations of critical regionalism and I was wondering if you could speak about these limitations um, and, and what I found interesting that towards the, the sort of very end of the book uh, you seem to suggest um, that your work has had more impact on a sort of smaller scale, and I was wondering how the resistance that is sort of resistance that is implied in critical regionalism is is tied to this notion of this very specific notion of the scale of the building. That's quite a lot. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's more than one question, I think. But in any case, uh, the it's organic. It's it. It's, uh, it's all tied together at the same time. And uh, yes, well, the first thing I think to be said is that uh, the, the term itself was uh, coined by Alexonis and Leanne Lefebvre in, in a very, very important essay of 1981, and, uh, which, is a, which is a comment on uh, two major Greek architects of the mid-50s. Dimitri Picionis and Aris Konstantinidis. And the title of the essay itself is Dualistic, The Grid and the Pathway. And, um, and the grid, uh, they never actually say this, but the grid is, is clearly uh, Aris Konstantinidis, and the pathway is, well, uh, it's generally, well, I think specifically it is the uh, the landscape that Picionis made outside of the Acropolis, also in the mid fifties, and um, uh, well, I, I I think the coinage of the term in the first place, and then this dualistic aspect uh, in 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 the way the term is given meaning by them in relation to specific practices, uh, is a very Sort of, it's a legacy that I surely inherited from them, and I've, I, I've tried always to uh, credit them appropriately. And in fact, <laughs> on one occasion, not so long after that I got interested in the <coughs> two terms together, uh, I was present in a, in a kind of seminar in, uh, in Delft, in the Netherlands, where <coughs> Where Alex Onis was present, and he, and he, on a blackboard, he wrote the words "critical re regionalism," and then rubbed out certain letters to make it "critical realism," <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I, d uh, well, you know, I got the message I think from him, <laughs> uh, and and uh, and maybe you know that it is this question of how real is this. Uh, because obviously that was implied in this gesture, I feel. Um, you know, it was something I also experienced here in the States because, and, and that leads me to this question of uh, tectonic, you know, the I, I backed off into the position of, of well, the, that is all, would then become the book Studies in Tectonic Culture. And, um, Well, I, there's no question that the that these uh, towards the critical regionalism six points for an architectural resistance, which was a reaction to the 1980 uh, Paulo Portuguese uh, Venice Biennale, which was um, uh, you know uh, well the slogan of course says everything. His slogan, the end of prohibition and the presence of the of the past, and uh, it was, I, I think, you know, with the, the Strada Novissima, uh, Novissima, so aligned with these uh, shop fronts by rising architects, um, 
you know, says everything about, well, about it, the scenographic aspect. And in fact, of course, that the works were actually made by the uh, scene, scenic designers of the Cina Cita, in fact. So, you know, it was, it was, uh, you know, unav unavoidably very scenographic. But <coughs> even so, I, I think that uh, in as much as I remain uh, faithful to that essay, which is, the date is 83, um, in fact, interestingly enough, both uh, Habermas and myself are in the uh, anti-aesthetic uh, anthology of, of uh, Hal Foster's. You know, also both essays are a reaction against the uh, Venice Biennale of, 80, uh, of 1980. This is perhaps, <laughs> uh, you know, a hopelessly kind of elliptical response to your question. Um, and uh, you, you, um, you, uh, you ask, you know, am I still convinced about it? Well, I think, I don't know what to say really. I mean, I think in, 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 in as much as it has been sort of lived out, so to speak, by architects, uh, in particularly in the, uh, Asia and in uh, also in Europe to some extent, um, you know the the and also above all of course in Latin America, the 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 idea was a kind of uh, the term itself the and and the six points for an architectural resistance were, was I think you know a point of departure or, or became a point of departure for. Uh, architects that were not part of the transatlantic Eurocentric uh, 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 connection. Although, I mean, if you if you think of uh, Spain, Italy, and so on, you know, uh, of course there was a certain influence there of the idea. Uh, well, or, or, you know, the question arises: Did the work come first, or the idea? You know, I mean, uh, Mary showed just now, you know, the. Um, that issue of AD, which um, features, you know, um, um, Gino Valli, and uh, you know, I mean, that the work of Gino Valli is long before that, uh, before the the term is coined even, and, uh, and in fact, G uh, Gino Valli was celebrated, you know, uh, for his uh, for the inflection that he created, you know, by Joseph Rick work. Uh, long before I uh, published, uh, and in fact, it it is Rick Wirt that uh, is the author of the pe of the feature on Gino Valley that appeared in architectural design. So, you know, it, it is uh, it's bigger, you know, both in terms of uh, um, in terms of well, really in terms of the kind of spontaneous production in different parts of the world. But uh, I think part of your question is, you know, do I still, uh, uh, you know, do I still subscribe to it? And uh, well, I do. And uh, but I think, you know, we we have moved into another moment in a way. That that's why I m mentioned in the brief that th this this word microcosm, you know, yeah. because I think that. Um, you know, compared to the modern movement and the ambitions of the modern movement, uh, you know, realistically speaking, the, the profession uh, has this possibility of, uh, of uh, holding operations in a way. Uh, the, the making of microcosms, you know, that are of significance and uh, of cultural significance mm -hmm. and also uh, can be, because uh, I don't think it's entirely separable of, of political significance as well. And um, and I, I think from that point of view, uh, you know, there, there are certain architects that uh, are exemplary in as much as they are able to create uh, works which have a kind of a discernible presence and also give something to the society in a, in a very uh, powerful way even if they're quite small. In fact, often 
because they are small, they have this kind of impact, I think. <laughs> and, uh, and that should be, in my opinion, well, that is what I mean, really, by evoking the word microcosm, you know. Because I think that, realistically speaking, coming back to uh, realism rather than regionalism, uh, you know, the, the possibility in, in one's professional life is uh, for the generation rising, you know, is, is to achieve works of that order, you know, that have that kind of presence. And, um, and there are many architects that one can point to that, that have created works like this. For instance, uh, very recently I was, um, I attended an event in the Royal Academy in London <coughs> where an Irish architect named uh, Shane de Blackham receives a, a medal from the Royal Academy, which I don't think they've given it too often, but a medal for architecture. So he gave a lecture, etc., etc., and there was a whole uh, publication of his work. And, um, and another Irish of, an, of, an, of a younger generation, uh, when it came to <coughs> questions and answers after his presentation, he used exactly that word. He said, you know, to the older man, you know, I always feel, you know, that your work has a, it's important to me because it has a presence. You know. And I think this, this question of presence, or this, this kind of intensity that it's still possible to make, is is something that one should really drive for, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think this applies also to education and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I think this idea of micro uh, there, there's this beautiful <coughs> moment in your conversations where you discuss sensibility as a sort of environmental um, consciousness, as 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 environment engaging issues of both identity and social su structures. I think that that sort of relates to to what you say about microcosm. <coughs> um, even though we, we, we have moved onwards, as you say, just to, to stick with critical regionalism for a moment, Mario, you were um, studying at the school, let's say during maybe the heydays of, of <laughs> critical region. Could you explain a little bit, maybe also for uh, all of us who were not uh, there yet, what, what it was like, uh, what the school was like at that moment? Yeah, th thanks, Bart. Um, and um, I want to say a, a heartfelt thanks also to, to Mary and to Daniel and, and mostly to, to Ken, um, you know, because you're the reason that we're all here uh, tonight. And yes, yeah, so I, you know, I arrived here from South Carolina in 1987 <laughs> and first encountered Ken in the slide library, which used to be in, uh, uh, in Fairweather. I won't get too nostalgic about that, but I, I really do appreciate Mary um, your, uh, your introductory essay on Ken's idea of the critical, because it's looking back now, I didn't know it then, but uh, it, to me it was the critical was not only within the history theory, mm -hmm. but now looking back I remember we received this list of books to buy as incoming first year students, and Illuminations was at the top of the list. It was Walter <laughs> Benjamin. Uh, there was also a book by Paul Clay, there was Roland Barthes, and so critical was not just happening there in history theory, it was also a discourse that was part of the studio. And Ken's construction of the Mark curriculum was, yes, important to housing, but it was actually started in first year, yeah. unbeknownst to us in the Absolutely. way in which that curriculum was constructed, and I'm wondering if, if both of you or either of you could kind of talk about could talk about that because it now becomes much, much clearer to me. It's like, oh my gosh, wow. We were reading Habermas, we were reading Benjamin, we were reading uh, Roland Barthes, you know, first day, you know, in the MARC program. And I can also recall there were a couple of bookstores on Broadway, you know, every new Minnesota Press book that came out, you know, we had it on our desk. So might you, either of you talk about the the way in which sort of critical also found its way into the discourse in the studio. Well, uh, <coughs> yeah, this, this could be a, it could be a very long conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Stephen is sitting right in front of me here, Stephen Hall, and um, 
you, well, the two things, that, two names that well. First of all, Stephen, and secondly, uh, Jim Polchek, who was the dean in, in which we worked with, under, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I worked particularly with, with Stephen, and so it's not that um, that collaboration wasn't so much a history theory collaboration as, um, as one, one, you know, that was clearly geared towards uh, educating architects. And I, I recall, you know, Stephen and I together, you know, we, we played around with this Paul Clay book, Point Line Plane, and we developed a first year curriculum that was based upon this idea of exercises uh, that would uh, emphasize these three terms. And, uh, but that was only part of, um, of an ongoing uh, effort to develop uh, a, a curriculum, a, d a design curriculum for the whole school, actually. And, and uh, I was reminded recently that other figures who, in the end, didn't remain in the school. I mean, that, that's also another thing. You know, you can, if one's really, I don't know. Anyway, it's a sobering fact that, uh, you know, uh, you can find an absolutely brilliant teacher who somehow or other isn't recognized by the institution, and they simply let the teacher go, you know. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of someone who was a, one of the last assist assistants of Le Corbusier. His name is José Ubery. He was an unbelievably gifted uh, architect and teacher. And, and part of this moment when I'm working with Stephen on trying to, uh, I don't know, develop a, a curriculum for the, whole, for the whole three years, basically. And, um, well, we, we had limited success. We did have some success. I mean, but, but of course, all these things are always very organic and they are somewhat fragile. You know, they, they uh, you know, I, maybe it's easier or it was easier at another time to be more categoric and to sustain a pedagogical position, you know, it's more, much more difficult today, I think, and, uh, and was even difficult then, of course, also. But, um, but of course, I, uh, I don't know what else I, I can add, you know, of course, it brings me back to this question of microcosm, etc. Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't really have, I think Ken said it well, I think there was an interesting combination that probably was changing just about when Mario came. Uh, first year, a real emphasis on gaining formal skills. Um, just <coughs> originally Klaus Herdick from Cornell taught it yeah, right. in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. He wrote a book or did two beautiful books called Formal Structures, I think was influenced in part by structuralism at Cornell. Yeah. Yeah. but. There was a desire, a kind of strange, interesting combination at that point that evolved in interesting ways over the years of a kind of mixture of this desire to have intense formal rigor with this social and political side, which mm. came out sort of slowly but clearly by the housing studio, mm. um, sometimes already in the spring first year. Mm. Um, and I assume those reading lists you got changed over time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forgot about those. I remember I used to tell people they had to read Somerset's Heavenly Mansion, some of the, <laughs> which I still think is one of the most beautiful books written, but sounds very dated to the current generation. Um, so I, 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 but there are things that have remained, and I think it's interesting to think about that too as they've changed. Obviously, the environment is probably the biggest change on all of our horizons um, that we didn't talk. We talked a little bit because you have to remember Earth Day started when I was in college. Um, but it wasn't like a major issue in architecture school. And I think um, when I say social and political or Mario does or Ken, I think what were the, the burning issues um, but I still remember, I, I, oh, I better keep my mouth shut. I was about to.
bring up a too heated a topic. <laughs> to what? <laughs> I remember the outbursts on postmodernism, and I remember oh. Saeed <coughs> getting really upset at the arcane discourse and just got up and almost shouted, this must have been 85 or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so there were battles on when to be formal, mm -hmm. when to be social and political. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They were intense. The other thing I would like to stress is we did not all agree. No. Um, there were huge, you know, we, you heard about Bob Stern. There was an Italian rationalist thing. There was a kind of late modernist thing. I'm talking early 80s now. But what was amazing is, for the most part, it wasn't personal. Mm -hmm. uh, there were these mm -hmm. intense discussions and debates. And I just keep hoping universities can continue that way, yeah. instead of just being dispersed little groups, that you can really have dialogue um, and confront those positions. I I've talked enough. I, I was told that at some point, whether you were using sort of gray or yellow sc tracing paper refilled oh, your ideology, right? I can ideology, tell you about right? Bob Stern putting pitched roofs on. I would yeah. give a critique, and they were, you know, kind of modernist clean things mm -hmm. and then he would come by my studio and put in a nice soft pencil and he's a very good draftsman too it, better than I was and he'd add pitched roofs to my I didn't know that projects. story <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can when speak um, yeah. a little bit about the book itself and specifically the, the genre of the book um, Isabel yeah, and, and Danielle like the, the, the f sort of the, let's say the format of its structures at, as conversations and also the, let's say, the possibilities that emerge through um, such a genre. I can imagine certain models, knowing Daniel sort of a film buff, the Hitchcock Truffaut <laughs> yeah. example, but yeah, what, uh, what are the possibilities here? Yeah. Well, I, I, I developed the two first interviews in that class. Uh, the seminar was on oral history and I was clearly not following the principles of oral history in these interviews because oral history is this kind of approach that you basically ask one question, turn on mm -hmm. the, the recorder and never interrupt. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like in the limit of the cathartic sometimes and mm -hmm. it's used many times to deal with traumatic event. And I was very interested in doing very structured interviews. Mm -hmm. So um, the teacher was very supportive and gave me a lot of advice, but basically I went to Enrique Walker and I said, how do you prepare an interview? <laughs> and he said, uh, read the Truffaut interviews to Hitchcock. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> that, that was, that's the short answer. Mm -hmm. um, probably that was the main, uh, I just read those interviews, mm -hmm. got a sense for what was possible mm -hmm. in the format, and um, we just started talking. Mm -hmm. uh, they were very structured in the sense that I brought the questions, but then in the editing process, of course, mm -hmm. um, hopefully that shows. Yeah that they got condensed and, and they flow. Hmm. Yeah, um, I can sort of pick up on that too, Daniel. Speak I think, up. speak up, oh gosh, okay. Um, I think there are actually many conversations that are happening in this book. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why the book is so wonderful. And of course, there's the main interviews which structure it. Um, but I think the sort of the nature of those interviews, what's most sort of compelling to me is the fact that you learn not so much, well, you learn just as much actually about Ken as um, a thinker, a scholar, a writer, an editor, as you do about the sort of, as we've said before tonight, the sort of cultural, political, um, social circumstances um, uh, that he sort of encountered and the development of those ideas. And so I think that the book is just, again, a, a sort of a portrait. Um, you said that word earlier, Danielle, that it's a portrait of, um, of a scholar, but also of a human. And I think that that has uh, actually a really powerful sort of political, that, but yeah. th there's, th there's something incredibly political about that, which is that we sort of uh, continue to sort of consider and look at um, uh, those that we sort of, the figures that we uphold in our field through a sort of full humanity, right? And that. Um, we learn about the sort of the, 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 the places Ken frequented, how he communed with others, what he was reading, who he was reading conversation with and writing with. And um, I think that's a really beautiful uh, and sort of political assertion. I just remembered there was another book I read at the time that gave me some ideas, which was this uh, 
I think he's called Martin Gayford, and it's called Mum with a Blue Scarf. It's an art critic that sat for a portrait with Lucien Freud. I, I have that and book. He <laughs> he does, it's more of an, of an impression of Freud mm -hmm. than, than actual interviews, but he's very keen on where did you drink, with mm -hmm. who did you drink, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> what did you <laughs> talk about, right, yeah. uh, did you fight. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. okay. Yeah. So well, th b that gave me some ideas for some of the questions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think also, um, you said it earlier, but that Ken likes to talk about buildings, but I think this book actually tells us that he likes to talk about books yeah. also, um, that he likes to talk. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't know, I think that, again, it, it like in the context of a school of architecture, that we this book sort of holds books and buildings on the same page. Yeah. Um, it forces us to look at them um, together. It holds discourse alongside practice. Um, and so I, went ac I actually went back flipping through um, the book earlier and I noticed that we, I counted all of the images in the book um, and sort of tried to track what they felt, the categories they fell into. And we somehow managed to have 19 books and book covers um, alongside 18 buildings <laughs> <laughs> and then another 18 sort of stuff that was right. floating around Ken um, throughout his the sort of development of some of these ideas and so um, again it was the ephemera it was the bars it was the um, other figures Arendt there's a beautiful portrait of, of her in this um, and, and I think that that says something about how like the sort of uh, these thoughts and these encounters again are just as um, material as building, mm -hmm. and I and I think that's a really um, powerful thing to to come to terms with in this book. Somehow, what you've just said reminds me of my wife, Sylvia, who is an artist, and she says, she often says that well, architects buy books, artists don't buy books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so there is. You know, there's something about uh, books and this field you know, that is inescapable in a way, I think. One, one question uh, that I'm sort of eager to ask, and I'm, I'm borrowing from an interview um, that you had with uh, Rem Kohlhaas at the Berlach Institute oh yeah, in right. the <laughs> early 90s, and <laughs> he asked you what is the role of the critic? So I would like to, to sort of rephrase or no, re, re ask you that question in this current moment. How do you see the role of the critic, or maybe the role of the historian, if those distinctions um, can or should be made? <laughs> God, your questions are <laughs> really <laughs> not so easy to answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, well, you, you, there's something, of course, a little parasitic about critics, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I think one could say that. In fact, a very close, my closest friend in London just <laughs> said exactly that to me before I left to come here. Uh, you know, about um, one's, uh, yes, the dimensions of one's life that could be seen as parasitic. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably cr critics can be seen as parasitic, I think. But, but that's a very negative view of critics. But I think one, one can also say that you know the, the critics really, um, at their best, you know, are, are figures that are contribute to the cultural discourse. You know. This is what they do basically, and uh, uh, they're very important um, in a way, in a quiet way. They're very important to to culture. Period. You know, and to the continuation of culture, and that's their that's the. That's the, the justification, I think. It's the, it's the way they, uh, the way they exist, the the, the rationale, the, the, the modus vivendi of, of of critics. I think it's what how they should be also. Maybe at this point we should yeah. open it up to the audience. Are there any questions, Daniel? Oh yes, here yes. <laughs> Dan. Dan. Yes. Dan. Sorry. Yes. There's a there's a microphone coming. Just a second. Yeah, coming, coming. Yes. This was such a delight, and uh, I look forward to reading the interviews. I was very moved earlier in the summer when you came to the talk I gave on Witkover. Ah, yes. And uh, I brought up the the subject of Witkover, who marked that word so deeply in our discipline, and this 
is, of course, connected with the history of Columbia University, the art history department in particular, yeah, right. which is microcosm. Because his view of the microcosm was that Alberti and Palladio always connected it not only with the social and the political, but with the cosmic, with the macrocosm. Oh, yes. And the next part of my question, which is over very quickly, <laughs> is the heretical follower, heretical, of Wittkover, who would have broke with him on this issue, is of course Colin Rowe. Yes. And so I, I was wondering if you could speak to whether or not, and you did somewhat at the Warburg Institute when I spoke about uh, the mm. microcosm and the macrocosm, what you think about that genealogy, which is in part here at Columbia. Yes. And whether it affected the way you think about the microcosm. Oh, well, I, I don't think it has that much, you know, but, but I mean, what you're touching on is, uh, you know, the importance of Colin Rowe in relation to Vitkova and, uh, and, um, and I think he had an influence on Vitkova and not just, not just as Vitkova influenced Rowe. And the, probably I have not uh, adequately recognized the importance of Colin Rowe, I think. I mean, uh, also maybe the importance of a certain period when uh, Vitkova publishes you know, the Architectural Principles of Humanism in uh, London in, in that particular moment, uh, which Rowe was very affected by. But, but the whole, uh, when I look back at it, I mean, I, I didn't really uh, appreciate it at the time, but the discourse of in the city as a whole, you know, due to the presence of um, immigre scholars, intellectuals that had come to the Warburg Institute um, um, and to the court hold, et cetera, et cetera. They, they, they had an enormous influence on this generation of Colin Rowe and uh, Thomas Stevens, who was also a very important figure, a talking head par excellence, you know, never wrote a single <laughs> book, but <laughs> certainly wrote very interesting articles on very diverse subjects. I mean, it was a particular climate, I think, you know, that that uh, that Vitkova was part of, and and um, hmm. not just Vitkova, also Pesna, and uh, yes, and, and they they were immigrants, of course, and then, uh, yeah. and uh, in in a very uh, relatively compact, small, relatively small context. And th that that produced, in a way, Colin Rowe, but also, I, I think that same discourse, in a way, produced you know my own the way I evolved. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and uh, I mean, there is no question that uh, the first person to recommend to me to read read Aaron's Human Condition is Thomas Stevens, who had taught Colin Rowe in Liverpool, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Not really, not really an adequate response to your intervention, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a question here as well. Help our mission. <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm Robert Fishman, a professor emeritus at uh, the University of Michigan, one of many people in this room who owes so much to you, to you Ken. Uh, my question is that when you published uh, Critical Regionalism, I think you said 1983, yeah. uh, I don't think any of us could have conceived of the rise of China and how it, you know, it so profoundly changed uh, the balance and meaning, really, of global architecture. Suddenly, Le Corbusier, whom we dismissed here in the United States, was alive and well in Beijing. Yeah. And, uh, I was. I would just wanted to challenge you. How would you know? How do you see this? Con you know, is is China in effect a kind of refutation of critical regionalism? How do you see? You know, how do you see that concept in terms of this, uh, as I say, unexpected transformation of global architecture? Well, I mean, so so many Chinese students, of course. Uh, who are now uh, uh, very interesting Chinese architects, uh, studied at the GSD in Harvard 
you know, uh, and it was a regular uh, sort of trajectory from uh, China to GSD. I mean, and I think they, you know, the GSD was perhaps more important than other schools in developing these Chinese uh, architects. But um, I, I, you know, I, I don't. I, I haven't made a habit of. Uh, like I've written a lot about ch uh, recent Chinese architectural production. Uh, there are, I don't know, five or so monographs, all of which were engineered by the architects. So they coming to me to write on their work, right? And uh, um, and and you know you can see that they have uh, the work has a lot of energy, of course. That is partly the product of the rise of Chinese power and the economy, clear, you know, and also uh, shift in uh, policy by the uh, Central Committee, uh, well, by the government to, to, um, to develop regional, to, to uh, emphasize, you know, regional centers. I mean, they have different reasons why they want to do that, but I remember that, I don't know what, like 12 years ago or something like that, maybe a bit more, the Chinese government had the idea to move 340 million peasants into cities, you know, and they, they clearly reversed that whole thing, you know, and, uh, and so the, what gave these Chinese uh, architects opportunities was this emphasis upon regional, you know, to, to reconstruct regional culture in a way. Um, I mean, you know, in many ways you could say for perverse reasons, like uh, there is a real effort on the part of the government to increase Chinese tourism, for example. You know, this, this, in, this emphasis on the regions is, is partly instrumental in that respect. But I think, you know, they... Uh, I'm thinking in particular of vector architects, you know, who... Uh, um, somehow understood Le Corbusier in, in, a, in a totally fresh way and, and produced, uh, you know, works which you could identify as having been partly Le Corbusier, partly Italian rationalist, you know, uh, with an enormous amount of energy in the works. And uh, so I, I think that's what you're alluding to in a way. And, and uh, but is this, a, is this a con consequence of this uh, towards a critical regionalism? I, I don't know, I think it's claiming too much for that uh, 1983 essay. You know, it, 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 it's just... Well, not, can you know, I <laughs> just intervene? Yeah. Um, yeah. When I was in Hong Kong for this event, uh, uh, where many of Ken's books ended out at Hong Kong U, I couldn't believe the impact of that essay, Critical Regionalism. Um, it was... But there's this kind of weird thing in China. Anybody who's been in southern China and just sees what I would call, I guess Ken would call just civilization, no regional identity at all, just one high-rise condo building after another. Right. And on the other hand, this really amazing, sensitive architecture that's trying to kind of hmm. discover either recreate bits and pieces of past architecture or mm. some regional identity. Mm. And, you know, I, I'm going to sound like Lefebvre. I just think there's this dialectical tension between this anonymous kind of architecture that's everywhere, it, at least in southern China. I mean, you just feel like it's going on and on and on. And then these places like the Academy of Art, uh, of Wang Chu, that are just so mm. Mm. consciously attempting to find some sort of yeah. regional identity. And, but I, I mean, Ken is maybe modest. I do think the essay had a huge impact. And curiously, so much more outside of the US in general than mm. in the yeah. US, yeah. which right. he explains yeah. in the book was partly why yeah. he moved on to tectonics. Right, right. Um, well, Wang Shu uh, uh, wrote uh, for... Yeah, and then quite, uh, uh, you know, does, of course, credit uh, towards the critical reason, you know, overtly. But, um, yeah, hmm. no, I think. 
but it's such a huge country. I have no idea what goes on <laughs> in parts of it. <laughs> oh, you know, the, this, this, made, this made me think of this moment. I, I was thinking earlier, you know, vis-a-vis -vis microcosm again. I was thinking of, you know, this most incredible thing, which is, it's hard to find it, but uh, I remember talking to Barry Bergdahl about it because there was this uh, uh, statement from Mies with the date 1951. And Mies says, that is why we can't build cities anymore. Old cities, planned cities, it goes on like a forest. And we have to learn to live in the jungle and even do well by that. That's what Mies says in 1951. You know. And I think, I was thinking earlier about, well obviously it's a bit on my mind, this question of microcosm. I mean, we, it's clear human beings cannot build cities anymore. It's quite clear they can't. You know, megalopolis clearly is not a city. And what Mary was referring to, and I was sort of alluding to the fact that the, 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 the power had the idea to move 340 million peasants into cities, and then they thought better of it, thank God, you know, because it would just be more, uh, you know, totally soul-destroying, you know, high-rises ad infinitum, and uh, with no, co no, uh, no coherence whatsoever, you know, just real estate development. And uh, you can't make cities just like that. So I think Mies was, you know, absolutely clairvoyant in 51 to say that is why we can't build cities anymore. <laughs> Extraordinary, I think. You, you might be happy to know that Wang Xu and Lu Wen Yu will be here next week speaking uh, in this room. Um, any any other Wang questions? Wang Xu is Wang Xu next next week. Yeah. Oh, next how exciting! Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'd, and more questions. Like uh maybe just one more. Maybe two more. There's someone there. Yeah. Sorry. No. Time to go oh, for a drink. Sorry. There, okay. in the yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. Mm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so that gentleman is leaving for a drink right now. Sandra. <laughs> 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 Sandra, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> are you going to have a drink? <laughs> you mean you have too much work? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Great to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Professor Frampton, hello. Um, I was wondering, in the context of, you know, the internet and digital technology and kind of digital world building and digital communities and digital cultures that kind of come out of this, do you have an opinion in those spaces, how um, critical regionalism applies? <laughs> I, I think that I think they're basically <laughs> incompatible. But uh, <laughs> you know. in in and in that case, would you say that perhaps this inter like transnational digital space is a is an area where there's space for um, kind of techno utopic uh, avant gardism in that case? <laughs> yeah, but uh, maybe. But I mean, what what would be the point though? I mean, it, uh, you know, it doesn't doesn't really need architecture, if you know what I mean. It has no need for it at all. I mm. mean, it is, it is what it is. You know, it, 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 you know, it is, of course, the mediatic uh, explosion, you know, that we are living. Well, inevitably, we are living in it, you know. And uh, it is what it is, I mean, but I don't think it has much to do with uh, uh, sheltering the the human subject, you know, I don't think it does because it's 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 physical. This question of sh sheltering the subject, you know, I mean, I I know it's uh, perhaps slightly odd to use the word sheltering, but I even think politically, you know, like a space like this has its own public political potential, and and if you don't have this space you know, which the digital is not capable of providing by definition, then 
You can't have this. And there's a very important point made by Hannah Arendt. Power remains with people as long as they live together, as long as they are together. And when they're not together, the power uh, is... is and, th and this uh, brings up another topic which I can't resist <laughs> mentioning. It is Massimo Kachari has this idea which has to do with the... And th of course, you could say it's a very European idea because it, it doesn't... Okay, we can't build cities anymore, but the old cities still remain. In Europe, anyway. And... Uh, and Kachari was mayor of Venice twice. And that's also unbelievably cultural because, believe you me, neither in the United States nor in the United Kingdom will ever an intellectual become mayor of a city. Forget about <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, forget about it. It's to, it's to the great credit of Italian culture that that has happened more than once. Uh, and, uh, and he, Kachari, has this idea of, which is also, by the way, because it has to do with this idea of uh, national, ge national dem democracy, you know. I, it's against national democracy, actually, because it, uh, Qatari's concept is federation from the bottom. That is to say, it's also a critique of the European Union, that the federation shouldn't be from the top down, but from the bottom up. And and it speaks to the political in the sense that uh, only when it's more direct, where people are close together, can it, you know, otherwise, at the scale of a nation and so on, it's, it's just a game of manipulating human beings, you know, in order to gain four or five percent uh, advantage to, to then go to power. But it has no, you know, it's like a democracy democratic idea is completely voided in, in that case. And uh, this is the present chaos of the United States, in my opinion, you know. It, it what will stop it from sliding into, uh, you know, finally uh, totalitarian, uh, we'll see. But, but I, I don't think it's digital is, is not pertinent to any of that. Th that anyway. would that would not be a good note to end on. I I <laughs> maybe, maybe we can get one sort of... Uh, <laughs>